I think I began that interest when I was about five years old when my mother taught me how to knit. And so I was um, counting a lot during that time and looking a lot at weavings and beadings and stitchery um, for these patterns that you could count. Um, I, um, let me see the first slide this way. Yeah. So I was also mark making. I mean, I was um, just doing pencil marks. Do you want to turn the lights off a little? And I saw Patricia had this scroll that she was working on uh, with the libraries. And I worked on this scroll. I don't know exactly how many feet it was, but it was a full roll of paper and just marked with different pencil strokes, different directions, until I completed the roll. Um, and I was also interested in the number five, um, because it appears in the Fibonacci progression and in a lot of natural forms. Um, if you cut an apple open, you see that star shape with the five points. Um, and so I did a whole series of um, tally marks, um, drawings with colored pencil, ink, and just pencil. Um, I was particularly interested in the golden, the golden mean, the Fibonacci progression of numbers. And, you know, just studying art history, you learn something about how the uh, Renaissance artists used the golden mean. And um, the gold, or the golden rectangle, the golden ratio, it's, um, it's all part of this system of um, numbers that you can find in the Fibonacci um, system of numbers. He was uh, an Italian, um, I think he was an accountant in the 1400s, and changed the number system from the Roman number system to the Aramaic system of numbers. Um, and the proportion between each of the numbers in the golden mean, or the golden rectangle, follows the um, Fibonacci system, the ratio between the numbers. I was interested in it because it was not uh, a, a boring arithmetic progression or a geometric progression. It was infinitely varied, and um, the numbers changed every time you did the progression. These are some of the um, works that incorporated the um, golden mean, the Fibonacci um, system. You can see that um, the Last Supper was also, um, I guess, uh, constructed in a way that followed the system. The um, Greek temples, um, Corbusier, the architect, also used it. And, um, and what do I have at the bottom? Yeah, that's a contemporary artist, Mario Mertz, who uh, created this igloo that, that uh, also follows the progression because the spiral is involved. And uh, this was one of his works. Of course, you recognize Mondrian, and that can be also uh, compositionally broken down to fulfill the Fibonacci system. These are some other contemporary artists who um, use geometry in their work. Richard Colwatt um, sculpted with all of these parts, and um, you can see. And the um, Drop City uh, um, construction was done in the 70s by the group of artists who were also interested in mathematics. Um, Karen Shaw uh, uses numbers to um, create these objects and words, a combination of numbers and words. And um, on the right is my um, silk screen that didn't use the Fibonacci progression, but followed the same kind of pattern development. Um, these are some more artists who also use math in their work. Um, a lot of geometry, and a lot of, even, oh, maybe several years ago, there was a whole movement called the Neo-Geo movement, and there are a number of geometric painters working today, and sculptors. Um, oops, sorry. 
And some more um, relationship to the golden section. It's known as phi, and there's a, a mathematical number that's involved in that, and that also has to do with the intervals between the spaces and the numbers. Of course, the nautilus shell, the pineapple, um, the sunflower, a, an awful lot of things in nature have to do with it. The relationship of the hand to the arm, the fingers, um, the joints in the fingers, you can use that system almost everywhere. And so it is very much a part of nature. Um, this was my, my first exhibition in the city, um, and it had to do with the, the Fibonacci progression, using the number five as the vertical, and along the horizontal was the, the system of numbers that ran to 114, 141 feet around a gallery. These are in plexiglass boxes, and every time the room changed or turned, there was a corner so that there are a number of different sizes to these boxes. Uh, one of these pieces is at the Guggenheim. This was the silk screen that uh, was produced in Germany, um, a very good printer put this together. And I really only had to give him a portion of it, one corner of it, and he was able to reproduce the other sections. But um, this was done on graph paper, and um, what I noticed also was, even though I only used the system of numbers that went through the five inches, um, all of these diagonals were formed by the numbers that intersected, and it was a very strange thing, even though the, the numbers didn't go all the way down to 144 feet in the, um, scroll, in the scroll, it still created that diagonal in each five-inch square. At the back. Um, there are a lot of websites, by the way, that uh, use math and art, and my favorite one is the viart.com. This young woman who lives out here, I think in Stony Brook, has these incredible videos that show you how to use geometry in, yeah. And not to interrupt, but we will share this with everybody after, so don't like, so, you know, don't worry about writing down all these URLs, okay, so you'll have it. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and I think the other one, um, on the right, it was just sort of a rough draft of a project with kids where they could um, translate their name into numbers and then graph the numbers into color. So you could see what your name might look like in a color. These are some more works. Um, on the left, the bottom, is the paper quilt. Before um, printers, I used a Xerox machine and... Um, I processed each square through the Xerox and added colors as uh, I printed. So I printed one color and then Xeroxed another color on top of it and so on and so forth. So essentially it was you know, pre-printing. Um, some of the other works are um, part of the painting. Well, the, the two on the right are um, watercolor patterns. I was always interested in patterns, as somebody mentioned to me, that recognized that I studied in Mexico for a while. I'm interested in patterns in all cultures, and also how, how it's developed through mathematics. Um, on the left is that circular um, work with acrylic on canvas, and I squeeze the acrylic out of a pastry tube. This is another work on uh, graph paper. I've already given up the progression, but I kept the pattern making in the same system. Um, after all of that work, um, I got off the grid and started working on canvas, and these are some of the works that came out of that. So there is the pattern, but there's um, not that formal type structure any longer. And I did this for a number of years. Um, then I moved to these 
cityscapes because I noticed the geometry and the color in, in the cities. And so even though some of these colors are arbitrary, um, these are very small paintings. They're two and a half by ten inches. And I wanted the sensation of something large on a very small scale. So that um, it's mm -hmm. something that sort of fits within your peripheral vision. That's why they're horizontal. Of course, the Domino Sugar Factory is no longer functional. Um, and some of these parts of Brooklyn, and I think the top one is Los Angeles, um, no longer exist. So it's a kind of documentary of what these places were. That was 10 years of that work, and then I moved to um, this kind of sort of um, anthropomorphic, biographic, uh, bi biomorphic figures and objects that had some sexual references, um, but also pattern and color. Um, a few of the extra pieces, these are ink on paper, and I guess um, I'll have to talk to Patricia about developing some of the ink products. And this is the more recent work. Um, this includes um, bits and pieces of fabric and uh, paper, so that it's sort of the beginning of the collage. And this is a more recent pattern work. This has a lot more uh, mixed media. And uh, the, uh, the idea for me is when I incorporate the mixed media, I want it to look very integrated so that it doesn't look like it's just stuck on. So uh, it's very hard to distinguish what is the media and what is the actual painting. And here we are at um, my connection with, Ju with Tulio. Um, I didn't meet him on eHarmony or Match.com. <laughs> we, we met on Facebook. Um, we both have a number of friends and we seem to enjoy each other's work. And um, I noticed that Tulio had been collaborating with uh, a number of people for a number of years. I don't know exactly how we decided to do this, but somehow it came about. And it's a very simple way for us, or for me anyway. What I do is download some of his images and um, print them and use them in my painting. Sometimes I um, change the color or cut little areas, but since I started doing that, um, I have continued to do that. So Julio, Tulio, I don't know, Julio, Tulio appears in a lot of my current work. So here's an image of his. Um, this is mine on the left, pomegranate, and this is what he did with his technology to that image. And in fact, th it was another image that he did recently that I used that particular image. So it's sort of a recreation of my work in his work and then back to my work again. And you can see mine on the right and his on the left. I think I used this piece recently in uh, another one of the paintings. But he is the technologist, and I am just the kind of conservative artist. What are the sizes? Okay. Uh, yes, this, uh, you know, I've been collaborating with people uh, much all of my life. I'd like to give you some of the history of that. and. Uh, I thought rather than improvise, I would uh, script it. So uh, rather than uh, worry about uh, giving you wrong information, I thought I would write most of it down. So here you go. Uh, this slide, this is the first slide. And I, I think, how would I format this uh, presentation? So this slide borrows formatting from Facebook and the net. Uh, much of my collaborative energy has been focused since the mid-1980s. I've been online since the earliest days of electronic uh, bulletin board systems, uh, CompuServe, things like that. Anybody out there have a CompuServe uh, address? No? Appropriately, Facebook is where I met uh, Di Shapiro and where our collaboration was formed. And you can go to the next slide, Dee. 
A, um, a brief overview of sources of my art and aesthetic vision begins with cave art. These artists perform their work in the deepest recesses and most revered spaces of their culture. Working collaboratively and underground, their work executed from 4,000 to 10,000 years ago informs and energizes contemporary culture. It is generally acknowledged that the symbolic thinking and aesthetic vision evidenced by the earliest cave represents the point of emergence of our own species, Homo sapiens sapiens. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, Australian Aboriginal art. It, it forms a continuous unbroken tradition that uh, stretches back 40,000 years, many years after arriving at my own way of making marks on paper and canvas, people pointed out similarities. I was introduced to Aboriginal art. Uh, as an example of convergent evolution, I find some significance in the similarities, as well as the differences between my time and uh, the dream time. So it's kind of, it wasn't really an influence, but I find that it's very interesting. And uh, I, you know, I'm not part of their tradition, really, in order to paint these paintings, you have to get permission from the ancestors, and it's really a different, uh, different line than mine. But I feel very sympathetic with their, with their vision of the dream time and space. Uh, next slide. Yeah, uh, as my work as does the work of uh, Deeds encompasses the striking mathematical relationships found in nature. Uh, Fibonacci spirals, arcs, and curves appear in my work as natural extensions of my hand, arm, and wrist. Uh, the strokes and brushwork in my drawing and painting exhibit these relationships. And again, that was something that I sort of discovered just by moving my hand and uh, noticing that it was really making the same arcs and curves that are made in these Fibonacci cycles. Um, next slide uh, introduces fractal geometry. It's a little different. It may call it a geometry in which uh, an infinite number of dimensions are posited. And so it has something to do with uh, the way natural forms uh, grow. I'm very, very interested in that since the concept of infinity to enter our world. Uh, if you measure the coastline of England with a smaller and smaller um, a metric every time, you would get a larger and larger number for the coast because there's so many crags and wrinkles in it. That's the, the kind of fractal surface that uh, is infinitely multiplying. Um, next one. Yeah, these are sort of uh, a distillate of my interests, uh, cosmology, astronomy, astronomy, technology, and artificial intelligence. Uh, the study of consciousness. For many years, uh, these most rational of human conceptualizations prompted me to engage business and research relationships in science and technology. This professional involvement informs and has become one with my aesthetic pursuit. So, you know, besides being an artist, I've had uh, technology jobs, and right now I own a technology company. We do uh, brain training, uh, neurofeedback, kind of a, a mental optimization. What's going on in the upper right corner there? Um, next slide. Concerning the historical development of my work and its influences, um, my inclination toward collaboration begins with the counterculture of the 1960s. Um, this decade represented my coming of age within a shared context of powerful social and psychological forces. For me, those forces appeared as a turning point for humanity in which a cooperative spirit emerged as we gained a truly cosmic view for the first time in history. Uh, I was on that march in Washington, uh, 1967. Uh, Timothy Leary was a friend of mine, and uh, I never went to the movie. <laughs> Next slide. I had a lot of fun participating in uh, the underground. Let me just uh, check. Is this um, does this look like a rip off review slide? I don't have a great view of things at the moment. No, nope. picture Timothy Leary. Uh, this oh, is the Timothy cool. Leary slide. Okay, I think we missed one. Maybe we could just click past it and go to the next one. Yeah, this one uh, has a lot of fun participating in the underground media publishing scene in San Francisco, where in the early 1970s, Rip-Off Review of Western Culture published my art and writing. There actually was an underground at that time. Um, that's your hirsute uh, presenter up there in the upper right corner. This turned out to be a high point of <coughs> countercultural and collaborative creativity uh, at that time. We didn't know it then, but it uh, 
people look back on it and see that a lot of our culture kind of spawned, was spawned in that time, late 60s, early 70s. Okay, next slide. I first met uh, Allen Ginsberg uh, in Greenwich Village. And is this the Ginsberg slide? Can't quite tell. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I first met Allen Ginsberg in Greenwich Village in the late 60s. I had run away from home, and uh, uh, he was hanging out in front of the uh, Village Theater with a rock group called The Thugs. Um, there's more to that story that I won't share. But anyway, until his death in 1997, we continued our relationship, corresponding, trading work, and occasionally meeting until near the time of his death. A Ginsberg poem dedicated to me and a drawing here some of the work that was generated as a result of these interactions uh, was just the kind of thing where when we would spend time with each other before we left it became a token trade something back and forth and I have a piece of cardboard this was in 1994 just three years two and a half years before he died and we had been talking about death and, and uh, it was just a beautiful little drawing he made there I think it was probably William Blake's sunflower the word ah is a quote from sunflower the little skull under the ground, so it's kind of maybe a re reincarnation or a rebirth piece. Um, very nice, and maybe we can go to the next one. You know, probably my paradigmatic uh, collaboration occurred with uh, Keith Haring, and uh, this was cut short by his uh, uh, untimely death in 1990. Uh, I received, a, I was one of the first people who wrote about his work uh, while he was still an anonymous artist and the uh, underground subway artist in the 80s. We happened to be from the same uh, hometown, same part of the woods, and I was writing about art, so it was natural that I would find out about Keith. And um, I received a grant in 1986 from the Pennsylvania about what would collaboration be in the 21st century? Would it be mental telepathy? Would we be using computers? Uh, and the whole idea is attaining some sort of an egoless state that it's kind of and it connects us to the traditions of the art of the past. Of course, he died in 1990. Uh, we got as far as we got to continue on in this uh, um, tradition. And so for the last, uh, since then, I've been collaborating almost exclusively with artists uh, on the internet. And uh, the next slide kind of brings up some of those uh, participants there. They range from artists to um, engineers to uh, musicians, performers, uh, software people. And on the right, um, there is a, uh, a introduces the, the work that I did with Perry Birch. Uh, before her untimely death in 2013, Perry Birch and I collaborated on a series of multimedia videos. Perry's studio at the time was the result of an artist residency she was doing at the Thermal Fluids Lab in the College of Engineering, Mathematics and Physical Sciences of the University of Exeter in the UK. So she was working with scientists who were uh, uh, working with fluids under very high pressure and high temperatures. And she would photograph these works uh, with regular macro, micro photography and, uh, get, and, and make, make art out of them. Well, we met on the internet and, uh, and she liked my music and we, uh, text, we added text and we put a bunch of multimedia works together. Uh, you were about to experience one of them, it's called uh, astronomy.
Thanks. It's always uh, very gracious saying thank you for a collaboration because, uh, you know, it's someone else you're thankful for, someone else you can be less embarrassing just being thankful for yourself and your own work. So thanks for Perry as well. Um, this is a view of my studio today in black light. Uh, these paintings consist of fluorescent, phosphorescent paint, sand, glitter on canvas. So 
they have one form in daylight and then uh, in black light, ultraviolet light, they look different. When you turn off the lights, uh, then they glow in different patterns. So I think that's a kind of interesting way of engaging uh, the, uh, the issue of what a painting actually looks like is very uh, dependent upon what kind of light is, uh, is on it. And uh, we'll get up to the point here where uh, I was uh, meeting Dee and uh, running into her work. So I think the next slide. Um, yeah, I was at this series, two works which began as color-coded marker drawings and were then scanned and manipulated by software. This is what I was doing when I met uh, Dee on Facebook, whose work I had always admired. Uh, she had said to a, a mutual friend that she would like to use my work in her collages. Uh, I think it was Lori Ellison and another artist. And I typed a positive response, and then we were on our way to continuing a collaborative project. <clears throat> Next slide uh, is the first work uh, representing our collaboration that Dee published uh, on Facebook and in the Long Island Biennial Exhibition uh, at the Hexham Museum. It's called uh, Tulio's Offering. And it contains my piece, Electromagnetic Impulse, and its echoes within it. So I would be finding pieces of my work and Dee's work and pieces of hers and mine. Uh, the next slide uh, has uh, uh, her, her piece called Pomegranate, the first piece of hers that I used in a composition. Her image appears in various forms in several of my recent works one of which is the great pomegranate for Di Shapiro, an ink and pierced paper drawing, besides providing a way to take the focus away from my own aesthetic ego. Working with Dee gives uh, me access to powerful gender-based imagery that I could not really conceive of on my own. So it really frees me up, and it gives me a great uh, uh, possibility for personal, personal growth and transcendence, one of the things of collaboration. You get kind of beyond and outside of yourself. And the next one is another uh, piece that we've been working on. Uh, this is her Empress of uh, Good Humor. Oops, sorry, in this one. Can, can we go back one? Uh, gee, maybe not. OK, we'll just go with that one. This is, uh, that's fine. Uh, this is the tongue of the universe. It surprised even me, uh, even now when it happened uh, in that way. It represents how collaboration can create work that's thoroughly unique. Uh, this one, a lot of times when I'll be working with program software, uh, you have to walk away while it's processing, and then you come back and it looks different. We also do many, many different versions. Um, so whenever you come back, it's always a surprise. Uh, out of many, many possibilities of using Dean's work, I really like this one the, the best. And um, it became uh, my version of the tongue of the universe. I have a, just a little statement for an ending here, um, and I'll, I'll read it to you while you read it yourself. Uh, we're learning from our historic failures that we must reformulate our deepest assumptions about the world and our place within it. The end of the old sciences of separation, reduction, inflexible logic, and absolute certainty lead us ineluctably toward new science of connectedness, relativity, complexity, and possibility. As we learn to listen more attentively to the beating of our hearts and feel more deeply the breath in our lungs, we come closer to our common humanity. As we begin to ask the right questions, we observe the answers are present within us. Our minds move inevitably toward the conclusion that instead of what can be accomplished by competition, power, and domination, the ultimate purpose and meaning of life can be cultivated by compassion, communication, collaboration and cooperation. And uh, you know, I think just like this event today, you, you can't make it perfect because it's so complicated, but you can make it good. So thank you very much. And I wanted to thank Julio also because there were no strings attached to this collaboration. I was amazed. I could do whatever I wanted with his work and he could do with mind whatever he shows and uh, I think the, the collaboration will continue and also I've learned a tremendous amount from him and his work as well as from Patricia today so it was an experience for me as well. I want to thank everybody too. By the way he's a, a writer, a, a poet, um, I write also so we have uh, we collaborate in other ways with our intellectual life. <laughs>